and for entertainers and athletes and those who are esteemed highly in our society and culture, how much more in keeping yes. with the exhortation of the great king of Israel, David, who said, clap your hands unto the Lord, all ye people, and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. There is one place where there ought to be joyful singing and noise, it's in the house of God. Amen. I know we live in a day and time through the years when the church has become very sophisticated on one hand. And it is unbecoming for some churches to make a joyful noise or to clap their hands or to stomp their feet. But David did all these things and more and said that the people of God ought to rejoice and give praise unto him in this manner. That we ought to lift our voices unto the Lord. I would love to have been in the time of Israel at different times in their history when they had a great victory and they lifted their voice so they had a great deliverance at the hand of God and they lifted their voice and it said and a great shout went up from Israel. And you can imagine a million or more people shouting together in harmony. It must have been thunderous throughout the land and the surrounding nations. Oh, I long for the day in John's apocalypse when he said he saw a number that no one could number. We were all singing a new song saying glory to the Lamb. He is worthy. How great a shout how great a time of rejoicing it shall be. Amen. Praise God. Well, welcome to Equipping the Saints Ministries, to our Sunday General Assembly. Today is Resurrection Sunday, Sunday, April 16, 2017. Today we want to preach from the Gospel according to Mark. And I will have you stand for at least one of the readings because we will read several passages. Uh, reverence for the Lord and His Holy Word, I would ask that you would stand for at least one of the readings. And we will begin with Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, and we will read verses 43 through 50. <coughs> Mark, chapter 14, verses 43 through 50. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Would you turn your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. Verses 21 through 41. Mark chapter 21 through 41. 15, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through 41. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. 
Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have ye forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour, sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Younger and Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, would you turn your Bibles to the next chapter, chapter 16, and we will read verses 1 through 8. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, Bought, spike, brought, uh, bought spices so that they might go in anointing. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. Last week's message was titled, The King Enters the City of Jerusalem. Today's message is titled, The King is Crucified, Buried, and Raised from the Dead. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, the truth of your word, for these reliable historical accounts of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, O oh Lord, as we celebrate His resurrection, as we look into these scriptures, I pray that you give me all grace to preach and to minister the Word of God in such a way that it will be a great benefit and profit to your people. And I also pray, Lord, that in preaching the Word of God, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be seen, revealed, and heard by your people that the word would have a place in the hearts of your people so that your people might have a greater foundation and be more greatly rooted in Christ. Father, I pray for us all that you would bless us with your presence at this hour. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord.
movie based on the book by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. And I want to encourage you, before I make my comments or statements, to make sure that you go see the movie. It's a very, 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 very good movie. In fact, it's an outstanding movie. And sometimes, tragically, Christians fail to support Christian movies because oftentimes Christians have worldly notions, and those worldly notions lead them to the conclusion that Christian movies aren't worth supporting because they are not of the same quality or caliber of Hollywood movies, secular movies, movies that are oftentimes made by atheists and agnostics and antagonistic antagonists and those who are enemies of our Christ and His cross. Of all the things and movies that we as Christians support, it is a shame to the body of Christ when we do not support Christian films. When you understand the multi-billion or trillion dollar industry that the movie business is, and Christians contribute the majority of that movie, it is a shame when we fail or refuse to spend a few dollars to support the Christian film. Especially one of this caliber and this quality. It captures the essence of the book so that if you've ever read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, you will be pleasantly pleased to discover and find out that it sticks with the book. And even though the book is a dramatized film, it nonetheless is true and maintains the integrity of Lee Strobel's writing. The quality is outstanding. The production is exceptional. And those of you who like good quality and exceptional production, you will be very pleased with this film. As good as many other Christian films have been of recent times, this is probably the best of them all in terms of its drama and its production. The cinematography is quite impressive as it captures the essence of the setting, which was the 70s. The storyline unfolds patiently, effectively, and flawlessly. The cast is excellent itself, and the acting is exceptional. It presents convincing arguments and compelling evidence to the audience. It's a great apologetic tool to equip believers, but it's also a great polemic to convince skeptics, atheists, antagonists, and agnostics. I encourage you to see the film if you have not. I also encourage you to invite friends that perhaps might be unbelievers or skeptics, those who want proof or evidence to go along with you. There are many things about the movie that stood out to me, and as I watched the movie, having read the book, I was indescribably impacted by this movie. I wanted to stand and proclaim the truths that were <coughs> communicated in the movie. I cried, I laughed, I rejoiced, I was strengthened and solidified in my own beliefs, and I was encouraged and excited to tell others about the evidence concerning the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how amazing is our God as today, looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith, we started out with the providence of God. Now we see the providence of God as He has providentially orchestrated that this movie would come out the week before the resurrection. And Sean prayed in the opening prayer that today would have great impact upon people all over the world, that the world would feel the impact of our Lord's resurrection. In addition to that, it is my prayer that this movie coming out at this right time in the providence of God would have great impact upon the world, upon skeptics, upon atheists, 
agnostics and antagonists all over the world. One of the many things that was said in the movie was this, to do the research and follow the evidence. And that's what we must compel skeptics to do. The excuses of the skeptics to merely dismiss the, 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 the reality of Christ and his resurrection is unacceptable. They must do the research and they must follow the evidence and they must enter upon their research objectively. They cannot enter upon their research with bias. But they must have an open mind to the evidence that's presented. One of the other things that is said in the movie of the many powerful things that were said was after compiling so much information, data, and evidence, and looking at it over and over each day, it was said to Lee Strobel at one point, how much evidence is enough? How much do you need before you are convinced of the proof of the historicity of the person of Christ and his bodily resurrection? One of his colleagues says to him in a moment, don't take your anger or frustration out on God, the church, or me but do your job. And his job as a journalist was to objectively research the information or the data that was available. And we must compel skeptics to do the same today. A third and final statement that was very gripping among the many, and there are many below. He's speaking to someone who has been arrested and then dying and convicted of shooting a police officer. And Lee at the time was convinced that this gentleman was responsible for shooting the officer. Only to discover later as he searched deeper that the gentleman was not responsible for shooting the officer. And when he confronted the gentleman face to face, the gentleman said to him, you didn't believe simply because you didn't want to believe. The truth of the matter is, when it comes to skeptics and atheists and agnostics, that is what it is for them. They simply choose not to believe. They ignore and they deny and they reject the abundance of evidence that is available to them. And as believers, when we are challenged by them and confronted by them, we must do the same. We must tell them or say to them, you cannot simply believe what you want simply because you want to, but you must look at the evidence and then make an objective decision. The struggle got to a point where he could no longer deny the evidence. He could no longer dismiss it or raise any more objections because all the way through, every time he found a new piece of evidence as he was following the thread, he said, I can no longer present any new objective to the evidence. The evidence was undeniable and overwhelming. Everywhere he went following the evidence, there was only more proof of the evidence. Obviously, seeing the movie was very inspiring for today's message. And I almost wanted to have church yesterday. I was so excited and so amped because of the movie. But we must contain ourselves as much as we possibly can because we want to communicate some things to you, things that we've communicated to you over the years and even last year. Relax and be patient for the next moments that we have.
Before we begin or get into our text, I want to remind us of at least a couple of critically important things, and these critically important things are these. Holy Scripture, the Word of God, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christianity, as I've said many times before, aren't simply religious or emotionally driven human notions. They aren't the der derivation or con concoctions of human beings and human thought. They aren't the result of human creativity and imagination. But they are evidentiary. When we say that, what we mean is that they are based upon objective, historical, archaeological, literary, scientific, and medical evidence or proof. In fact, Luke, the historian and the physician in writing the church, the history of the church in the book of Acts, he recorded in the first three verses of his book that Jesus had shown himself alive after the resurrection by many infallible proofs, many convincing evidence, irrefutable and undeniable evidence that he had in fact and indeed been raised from the dead. The evidence is overwhelming. And there is an abundance of evidence for any true seeker. And this evidence has been proven over and over again and again throughout many generations. Last week our main focus was on the triumphal entry of our Lord into the city of Jerusalem. But before we got into our main text or passages, we took some time to do a brief overview of Holy Week. Again, Holy Week is the week of our Lord's passion or suffering. It was our Lord's last or final week in His flesh. This week our main focus will be on our Lord's death, burial, and bodily resurrection from the dead. Let me just say here that it is crucially important for us as Christians that when it comes to theology and doctrine, that we understand very clearly and that we believe that Jesus' resurrection was a bodily or physical resurrection. He was not simply or merely raised as a spirit or a phantom, but he was raised bodily, physically. And the proof of that is that he appeared to the disciples and he said, touch me so that you may see and know for yourself. He said, does a spirit or a ghost have flesh and bones as I do? So we know that Jesus was raised bodily. In fact, Luke in the book of Acts goes on to say in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, that not only did the Lord show himself to his disciples by many infallible proofs, but he said that the Lord has shown himself to them for over a period of 40 days. Paul records for us, as we'll probably allude to later, that Jesus appeared to over 500 witnesses at one time. So this week, as we focus our attention on the death, the burial, and the bodily resurrection of our Lord from the dead, and remember we said last week that these were culminating events, these were climactic events of the Holy Week. And not only were they the climactic events of Holy Week, but all of Scripture had predicted and anticipated Holy Week and these culminating and climactic events. So when we look at the New Testament, and particularly the Gospels, they do not stand alone by themselves, but they are the fulfillment of what God had promised and that the prophets had predicted in the Old Testament. So before we get into some of our text for today, as we did last week, I, if you would be patient with me, briefly look at the events that led up to our Lord's death, his burial, and his bodily resurrection, primarily using Matthew's text. So that as we resume our overview from last week, we left off with the early part of Thursday. And we want to continue with the latter part of Thursday, so that on Thursday evening, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, a Holy Communion, and had his last 
supper with his disciples. And then they left from there and went over into the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus left them and went a space and he prayed and he agonized. And the Bible said that he agonized to this extent. And he was distressed to this extent that the, the blood vessels broke in his body and the blood mixed into his sweat so that he sweat drops of blood. Because of the agony, knowing what it meant that he would now drink the cup. And you all know the account where he said, Lord, is it possible for this cup to be removed from me? But nevertheless, your will be done. And this cup was the wrath of God for the transgression of his people. And we see where our Lord is betrayed by Judas, as we read in our text, how Judas led the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and the temple guards into the garden of Gethsemane and gave them the sign that the one whom I kiss, he is the one. So we see the betrayal of Judas on Thursday evening and then his arrest. He's brought to the house of the high priest Annas and is scrutinized and interrogated. And interrogated. And the same night, Peter stands a distance off, witnessing it all. We all know that Peter goes on to deny him, even as the Lord had predicted that he would. So from the house of Annas, the high priest, they bring Jesus through a series of approximately six illegal trials. And all of these trials were in violation to the law that God had given them concerning people being brought up on charges and given a trial. All these trials were illegal primarily because they were done at night and they weren't carried out in the proper way. So the first trial, as he stood before Annas, Annas is looking for an opportunity to accuse him. So they ask him leading and accusatory questions to entrap him. They want him to say something that will be condemnatory. But our Lord says nothing that is condemning. He only speaks truth when he so speaks. Secondly, he goes to the trial before the Sanhedrin where he is inevitably condemned and they abuse him. And from there they go to the third trial and now it's dawn and Peter has denied him for the third time. And as he does so, Jesus looks at him. Can you imagine being Peter denying your Lord for the third time and he turns to look at you when you deny him? Can you imagine how overcome Peter was with overwhelming grief and shame and sorrow? The fourth trial, he stands before Pilate. And Pilate seeks to release him because he finds no fault in him. And Pilate says, this is some trivial thing that pertains to your Jewish laws, you deal with him. And then they use a power play against Pilate. And they say, if you don't do this, we will tell Caesar that you aren't his friend. And because Caesar was the great emperor, king of Rome, and all wanted to be in good standing with Caesar, Pilate did what he could do to please them so that he would not lose face with, with Caesar. The fifth trial, he stands before Pilate, and this is when Pilate seeks to see a miracle. Finally, goes into the sixth trial, still before Pilate. To please the people, Pilate has our Lord scourged. He has our Lord beaten. And several years ago, those of you who were here, you may remember that we took time to describe in detail what this scourging entailed. In Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, depicted it very accurately and very graphically. But our Lord was scourged. And those who were the pawns of the Sanhedrin or the Sadducees, they came in mass and they began to cry, crucify him, crucify him. And it's important for us to understand, beloved, that in our text where it says that they cried out, crucify him, it isn't the same people who were saying, Hosanna, but those who are now crying, crucify him, are those who are the pawns of the Sanhedrin and of the Sadducees. 
The people are weeping and mourning over our Lord just scourging because they have received him as the Messiah. So it's important for us to understand that. When they said, let his blood be upon us, that was not speaking of or in representative of all the Jews, but of that small group of political pawns who were doing the bidding of the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees. So Jesus is scourged and they scream, crucify him. And then he's finally turned over to be crucified. And the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, they mock him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They robe him. And they give him the stick to serve as his scepter. But they spit on him. And they punch him. And they beat him. And they pull his, the hairs of his beard out. Because they're mocking him as a king. They're ridiculing him as a king. Because in their understanding of a king, remember this is Roman, these are Roman soldiers, they only understand power. So as far as they're concerned, if he's indeed a king, then he will display and manifest some sort of power. And if, if he is in fact a king, then where are his hosts? Where are his armies? Where are his legions? But remember what the Lord said when he stood before Pilate. He said, I could have legions come in a moment. And if the Lord had called upon one angel to come, the one angel would have completely decimated all of Rome by himself. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, they would come and they would fight for me. And it wouldn't be a fight. All we have to do is go back to the Old Testament on those occasions where God would send an angel or angels to his people in war for them. And it was saying to David, you don't have to do anything. The angel of the Lord is going to win this victory for you. And it said that one angel wiped out 185,000 men. So if Jesus wanted to, as the king of glory, as the king of the universe, and the king of eternity, he could have called for one angel and completely decimated all of Rome. But that wasn't his purpose. He said, I have not come for this reason, but he had come to testify to the truth. So after the soldiers mock him, ridicule him, thank you, bless you, Judas goes out and he hangs himself because of his shame, his guilt, and his condemnation. Because he was the son of perdition, he did not know to simply repent of his sins as Peter had done. And after they beat him and mock him, they put a crown of thorns on his head and robe him and give him this stick, they now give place the cross beam on his back for him to carry. Some scholars say that the cross beams could wear weigh up to an excess of 200 pounds. That's just the cross beam. Now you have to remember this is, it's an old rugged cross. This cross beam is made of old, dry, rugged, ripped up uh, wood where wood fibers are sticking out and jetting out from all over this piece of wood. And remember what our Lord's back is like. His back is just strips of bleeding flesh where you can see beyond the white meat down to the bone. Now, think of every time you've had just an abrasion and you take your finger and touch it, how it stings. So imagine the back, our Lord's back, his arms and shoulders, completely shredded. And then to put this heavy block of wood on his back to carry over a mile to Golgotha. He bears his cross to the gate and on his way, as we read from the text, because he could not withstand or endure under the weight of the cross beam, he keeps falling under its weight, and they grab one from out of the crowd and put the cross beam on his back for our Lord in order to carry it up to Golgotha. Jesus is brought to Golgotha, and he's nailed to the cross, and contrary to tradition, Contrary to numerous paintings, our Lord was not nailed through his hands, but he was nailed through his wrists. Try to imagine having six to nine inch nails nailed through your wrists with all those bones there and all those nerves. The shooting pain is indescribable. 
We cannot understand the agony of our Lord as he was crucified, as he was beaten, and as he carried the cross beam, and then as he's nailed to it through his wrist and through his feet. And you have to understand, he's nailed through his wrist and he's hanging because of his weight. And he has nailed going, one nail going through both of his feet. And when you're hung like this, you, your lungs stop to collapse. So in order to take a breath, he has to push himself up. Now he has a nine-inch nail through his feet. Now remember, he's already lost almost all of his blood. He's going into he's gone into bleeding shock. He's exhausted. He's dehydrated. He's probably mentally delirious because of the loss of blood and exhaustion. He has no strength. He has no energy. And in order to get one gas of breath, he has to push himself up with those, the, 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 the nail through his feet, his whole back, his buttocks, and the back of his legs all shredded up from the cat and eye tail. He was scourged multiple times. That alone in some cases killed the person who was being beaten with it. So imagine pushing up with all your weight to get one gasp of breath on an old rugged cross with all the splinters and all the fibers of wood that are jetting out of that and going into those deep lacerations. Imagine the pain. The fact is we cannot imagine because more than suffering physical pain for us, our Lord was suffering the wrath of God for us. All of God's wrath was placed on Christ on the cross for us. So Jesus is on the cross. He's hung at 9 o'clock in the morning. The Bible tells us that he hung there for six hours up until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And during those six hours, he uttered his seven last words. The last of those two, well, let's read them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today, he said to the, 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 one of the, the, the uh, criminals on his uh, right hand, today he will be with me in paradise. And after that, he said, woman, speaking to his mother, woman, behold, your son, telling her that John will now care for you. Then he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he followed that with, I thirst. But the Lord's thirst wasn't simply a physical thirst. It was a spiritual thirst. Can you imagine eternally dwelling in the presence of God, the holy pericope, and now you are not with your Father in heaven, but now you are on this condemned, fallen earth. And you are being condemned to death by the Romans and the, and, and the, the Jewish leaders. So you can imagine that he thirsted to be with his Father. He thirsted for the holy pericope. He thirsted to be back in the presence of the Godhead. Back in the heavenlies. And then he said, the words that we love so much and mean the most to us, to tell us stop. It is finished. The debt has been paid in full. And after he paid the debt, he said, I commend my spirit unto you. 